Okay, so it had been a very, very, very long day with incredible presentations. And we would really like to open up the discussion to the students' input and our colleagues, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm walking around and I'm going everywhere where the hand is rising. rising. We have a, I mean, we have a series of questions prepared, but we would really like, okay. I'm still figuring out how to phrase this, but there was, in the morning we talked about creative collaborations and artists moving in, and there are some words thrown, like Michael, you mentioned like youth affordability was very vital to this, and talking about creative comes to mind the, the somewhat ambiguous term of the creative class which to some degrees gives this impression of like these young affluent professionals coming in. And then when now in the afternoon we started talking about these flexible housing for these multi-generational families. And they seem like two very different demographics. I'm wondering if what is the role then of say a family in these new creative clusters? So um, it's a huge question. I think it's probably the the topic of the um, of certainly of the 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 next four years. So last year there were there were um, mayoral uh, uh, cha shifts in a lot of American cities. So Boston got a new mayor, uh, New York got a new mayor. And they were all voted in on the platform of, uh, of um, uh, equity issues, of dealing with the, the, um, the affordability issues that, are, that everybody are very, you know, people are very aware of um, in, in certainly in these kind of creative cities, so to speak. Um, and so what's happening in Boston right now, um, we've spent 10 years talking about um, creating the infrastructure, like the startup um, uh, camps and the co-working spaces and the, um, you know, all of the infrastructure to develop a, a whole kind of uh, uh, strata of knowledge-based um, young new uh, businesses. Um, we, they discovered that, or they discovered, they clued in or remembered that they were actually only catering to that 1% or 2% of the already um, well, uh, um, you know, the, the wealthiest, the most highly educated groups of people. So all the rest, I mean, I, I, I don't know how it is in, in Canada, but in the U.S., the the income gap is just getting worse and worse in terms of the opportunities for the people on the upper crust and those the rest of the people. Anyway, so what's happening now is that there's this focus on how to create linkages to other kinds of jobs. So how to, one of the big topics is manufacturing in the innovation economy. So how, and commu the community college system who traditionally have a role of, of providing skills and, um, and catering to, you know, those who can't afford the high-end um, high higher education. So, so there's all these new programs emerging in, and linkages between um, those, the kind of working class sectors and this innovation economy. Um, there's a whole new wave of accelerators. I don't know whether you call them accelerators here. Um, it's kind of the new, it's for, uh, incubators, business incubators, um, but they're not just incubating, they're, ha they're being accelerated, they're like they're being helped along, um, opening those kinds of things in the poorer neighborhoods and in the gateway cities in Boston, there's a number of old mill towns which are where the immigrants come to in Boston, they don't come to Boston core. So there's all, there are these issues, the, these um, programs underway, a recognition that the thing about this new economy is it's not for everyone. And it never has been. Um, when there's big structural change, it's never been for everyone. But um, there's a growing awareness that somehow you have to create opportunities for at least a little bit more of the population than what's occurring today. 
Um, yeah, I think that's a, a really interesting question you had because I think uh, um, I didn't realize that that was on a collision course to be tested. The this sort of double profile conversation of, let's say, this kind of creative class sort of profile of uh, of um, people for these kind of clusters, and then these kind of let's say uh, multi generational families stuff that I had uh, shown on. I think it also was brought up earlier. Um, but I'll say this: I think clustering, okay. Uh, clustering inventively, uh, being intelligent with spaces you've got. Uh, we talked about this on the way here, some of us, about cars. We all know the story about empty cars driving and can you Uber X your way through this or Airbnb. Are we in a culture that with technologies uh, and a little bit of that faith, you could say, in, in what we do, that yeah, it's okay to try this out and pull it off. And ironically enough, the, you asked that question. In fact, it is exactly, I can't name names, but one of the most inventive um, ideas-based sort of collaborative companies is the client for this thing. So it kind of makes sense. It's, it's, it's already in their good Kool-Aid, what they're drinking about. How do you get smart about the spaces you've got? So when you're looking at a 100-year-old warehouse building, as Michael was saying, we're way more adaptable than we give ourselves credit for. Well, guess what? So is a family. And I think it's the aberration of the last century that we're trying to kind of overcome versus what we've been doing always. And one wonders is moving forward kind of already what we've done. And, uh, and I think that's maybe an interesting pattern to, to test and, and to see. Um, uh, the, the word class in creative class is an interesting thing. And I think there's maybe, if you, um, many of you may be able to think back to pre-2007. Um, <laughs> Uh, Pre-2007, um, there were no iPhones. Um, and then the idea of being able to build an economy on app designers was inconceivable, right? And this idea of the creative economy preceded 2007, and it was suggesting that uh, innovation, creation, the, the future digital economy, it's coming. That's 2003. They were predicting that it would come. And what it meant was that it was empowering a whole new generation of entrepreneurs who didn't require warehouse space, who didn't require huge infrastructure. They needed good internet. They needed contacts. They needed the intersection of their ideas with funding sources, whether online or in person. Um, and, it, and, and that was the creative class. It was all of you in 2003 who were the creative class. And it was anyone who could write code or imagine a better world. Uh, and that's still, I believe, the case. So that's on one side of the story. The creative class is, is uh, not necessarily only the, 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 the 1%. In fact, I would argue that it, the 1% may be helping fund the creative class, but the creative class exists regardless of that. Uh, in terms of families, I would say that um, uh, when anyone's choosing to be in a, in a city, um, uh, 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 coming from somewhere else, um, whether from somewhere else in Canada or the world, um, you're looking at uh, what this city offers, not just for employment opportunity, for, but for the full breadth of your life. And what's happened in the, in the last, uh, as my slides were showing, about the last 15 years, is suddenly uh, you, you, you're now able in the city of Toronto, as a result of funding uh, through uh, uh, the knowledge infrastructure projects and the, and the, and the uh, uh, and, and many other uh, different funding programs, as well as philanthropy. Um, you're able to create a city that offers the, that next level of, of, uh, of creative infrastructure, the institutions, the art galleries, the museums, the per musical performance spaces, the thousands of galleries that are, that are in, uh, in a city, thousands, and many hundreds of art galleries that are in the, in the city of Toronto. So um, uh, young families can come to Toronto uh, and they can have, uh, they can, they they can make turn their homes into places of, of research and and and, uh, and 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 app development, if you wish. I know people who are doing it now, many of them. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, uh, they're they're choosing a place where they're not just dropping in for a minute. They want to see it as a place where they can live. So the the you're seeing a, a city like Toronto being a place where you can you can invest your life in because of the richness of the creative economy, the richness of the creative class. Can I add something to, to the uh, creative industry? Um, for example, maybe you think about the San Francisco Bay, which is certainly one of the places in the world where these kind of 
app innovations had been accord, there was another reason why this happened in this area, because there was an anchor economy that already existed. So these young entrepreneurs and coders, yes, they don't need a warehouse, but they need nevertheless a place to live and something to eat. San Francisco is not necessarily a sheep city. And San Francisco has an incredible tradition of uh, angel sponsorship. And the angel sponsorship came from the doodle.com. That means there was money already in the area that was then reinvested into the next innovation wave. And this nearly means they operate like attractors. And the question is what happened first was first there, Barcelona is traditionally a city that let's say, regenerates itself through events, so Olympic Games and Forum 2004 that triggered uh, Barcelona at 22. So sometimes it's a city that starts and creates a seed. Sometimes it's just an eco economical situation, a creative capital that comes together. And these are layers that are added and added and added until the system reached a point of super creativity nearly, where it really becomes an attractor for a larger context and it's absorbing literally creative capital. I mean, a lot of students from Waterloo, they're going to the Silicon Valley though they get their really high-end education here, because this is obviously the cooler place to be, to talk about Richard Florida's ideas about place and to find the right place to be. So it's a very interesting relationship about ingredients that create a kind of condition where creative capital comes together in an economical way, but also in an intellectual way, et cetera, et cetera. And for example, cities like Berlin, they have an incredible infrastructure for families. And their main source for this are protected rents and huge apartments for families. This is the main recipe for attracting a lot of young people that have kids, and the city is literally over flooding with kids and kindergartens and schools, etc. I wanted to add to that for a second. Just uh, I find the, the the creative class or the or, um, I, I find it kind of it's it's funny because it kind of gets zoned into creativity means a cultural activity, it means uh, you know, digital technology, but it's also interesting how the creative uh, class is actually kind of seeping into other areas of the economy. I, I would say that all of the trades are actually kind of very interesting areas for creativity to find a place, or the business world. There's actually places for people who have creative sensibilities to actually make inroads into uh, all of the construction trades because they're, they're traditionally thought of as being unskilled laborers or some with a very specific labor. But in fact, you need very strong, creative, physical kind of imaginative skills to build things. And it's kind of related to the maker movement, but it's actually making things for money and not as a hobby, you know. And I think it's a very interesting aspect of the labor movement now that people with those kind of creative aspects are actually also kind of bleeding into other zones of, of employment because it's now seen that, sorry, but the you know, post-secondary degree may not be you know, the, the, the key to success. It may be that those creative aspects go into a completely different area of work entirely, which is why the whole employment lens is interesting because it's attracting a lot of people into those kind of uh, sort of anonymous spaces that you want to be able to provide for them that they can kind of come in and make what they need to make. Just to add my two cents. Um, Richard Florida and Kevin Stelarek of the Martin Prosperity Institute have been working on this issue of the creative class and, and not just bleeding into the constructions and the trades, but if they can crack the nut with regards to the service, work, service industry. Those folks that are out there, they're making minimum wage working two, three jobs every week and have a family, then if, if you could add that, that uh, value added, the creativity to the service industry, then we'd be in good shape. I, I just want to pick up on that. I think this is actually a terribly exciting moment for me, at least, because I think what's really great is, 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 apart from the obvious sort of profile of the creative classes, the Floridian kind of uh, view of it all, I, I like also, you know, what uh, Kim, you're saying too, and that that is this really just our way of acknowledging the, the the realities of, hey, guess what? That hat shop 
guy or you know or the girl who's going to run the the shoe repair shop like these kinds of people are coming back maybe because they have the incubation style culture or the, the maker kinds of places uh, they have a, a cultural infrastructure that supports this they they understand like we did in the turn of the century in the secret Gideon way of mechanization takes command that there is that return to the kind of uh, the butcher again and yes we could talk about hipsters and stuff like that but is there a real and honest sort of uh, return to the streets uh, and Andre would love to sort of see this happen on Eglinton and other different ways uh, in different sort of levels let's say across the city but but the creative endeavor is anything that maybe you want to do rather than just kind of show up at the big sort of work depot huge office with benefits and vacation plans um, not that that's anything wrong with that but but <laughs> yeah. uh, but I think this is is this open the doors for uh, that level of uh, almost individuality and endeavor within the, the the landscape of the city I wonder if I could ask a, a two-part question that, that picks up on that and and try, tries to give tries to speculate about a, a, a very, very broad context and then translate into quite specific kinds of space. A quick, quick comment is, is just that I'm absolutely struck by the optimism, especially of, 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 the, of the afternoon three speakers. I mean, Kim, you're, you're remarkable kinds of, of layered thresholds of bridging and Don, that, that, the, the coffee laboratory being worked in, into that garage-like like space. And, Jen, the, the, the remarkable series of, of opening hybrids of, of whole, se whole sections of, of the city. If, if I were to think in far too cartoon-like ter uh, terms of, of, of a past generation, I might divide it into four sections. I would think about a rather earlier generation in which, like Michael was, was alluding at the beginning of his talk, his talk, there was a tremendous concern for rebuilding the edges of streets with strongly framed po podia as as if as if mod modernism had had lost the sense of, of, what, of what space needed to be and and so getting things to line up and become coherent and and fit and filling in all the missing teeth was a kind of a moral mission a, ge a generation ago the uh, slightly after that a, a kind of questioning of, of power put putting a tremendous amount amount of work into looking at the subversive agendas that, that would be lying behind those, those surfaces and instead put, putting attention into the spaces of alterity, the, 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 the alleys, for, for, for example, the waterfronts, the, the, the marginal spaces, the, the brown fields, as a kind of a, a counterform of, of looking for a different kind of free zone, but without re really committing to a public. A third generation, per, per, perhaps, um, very much influenced by, by, by digital tools of reconceiving those, those spaces very procedurally in terms of spatial patterns, the, 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 you know, the coined term landscape urbanism with, with, with the pursuit of, of fields of, 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 of city making, trying try to see so, so many little bits organizing them, themselves in, into open planes, but again, without particularly, to my mind, committing themselves to a coherent public, Re really, really instead look, looking at a much more generalized, very diffuse kind, kind, of, kind of urbanism. If, if I think about those three preceding generations in my cartoon, I'm struck by what you have been offering us today as a remarkable kind of optimism of looking at a new kind of hybrid. And I, and I, I want, want to ask, if you would call it a distinctly new generation, this sense of, of a belief that there can be such a profoundly loose fit so that people don't need offices anymore, as in, the, in, in, the, in the, the Commonwealth Bank example that, that, you, that you offered, Jan, or the, make, the maker spaces, or so, so many other examples, and the, the kind of support for, for that kind of activity that, Michael, you spoke very directly about in the Algonquin College, college example, I, I think, in which you very deliberately layered spaces together in, in order to foster a, a kind of interchange. Would you call it a generation? Would, would, would you call this, this new conception as something distinct in its own right? If, if, it, if it is to be called something, and if it requires so much hybridity and so much preparation for change, 
then what are the specific kinds of architectural supports that can handle that kind of churn? I find myself thinking about heavy docks and floors and stages and, and immensely tough things that can take being bashed about and really celebrating the, 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 the kind of intense co-optation that, that the kind of activities that you've shown us imply. And so I, I do wonder about the specific architectural strategies that would foster the kind of remarkably optimistic fertility of, of this vision of urbanism. Could, I wonder if you could comment on those two, two things then. I mean, is it a movement? And what are the architectural strategies that can support that change? Well, I, actually, uh, one of the conversations we were having in the car this morning was, um, I was saying that it, it's kind of strange to me that with, I mean, completely um, new technology that we had certainly 10 years ago or 20 years ago, but we're still kind of working within the paradigm of 1940. We basically have the same process. We, we, we kind of, I mean, I'm, my father was an architect and I'm, I was saying, I think I run my office the same way my father did in 1948, you know, except that I send emails, you know, I mean, and, and we have Revit, but really it's the same kind of process of building, of getting tenders, of sending it out, of doing shop drawing, you know, all of those things are pretty much the same. They haven't changed. They're a little bit faster and maybe a little more stressful. <laughs> but, uh, but um, and, and I think there's like, there's a whole kind of sea change that has to happen at some point. And, and it's like the architectural object. I think sometimes we rely too heavily on old types that we know or that we are familiar with. And, and it's interesting because if people really want to have the old warehouse types, then we have to find a new architecture that actually gives you that. And it was an interesting question that Michael talked about, like, well, what are those characteristics and what are those kind of building types so that we're not faced, I mean, like in the DuPont study, what we've noticed is that the same Main Street example is a familiar kind of comfortable type for, or the avenues type. Um, we called it the Main Street types in 1990 when it first kind of showed its face. And, um, but in fact, that's, a, that's not a type that's really kind of fulfilling the things that we need to have in those particular areas of the city. So people need to rethink that. We can't always fill up every empty site with townhouses and, you know, uh, 12 story kind of very blocky buildings. Um, so I, I think there is a kind of complete change that has to happen in how we think about things how, and how they're made. I don't know how that happens, but it just seems to me that we're still stuck in the old paradigm with a new technology that should be allowing us to think much differently than what we are. I can, oh. I, oh, go ahead, Michael. No, uh, no. Well. <laughs> I'll just, uh, maybe, maybe I will. Oh, you go ahead, <laughs> no, please, <laughs> please. <laughs> Um, um, yeah. no. I was gonna, what I was going to say was that um, in looking through a number of projects before the, preparing the presentation today, one of the responses that we've had for a while in, in our office has been to try to open up buildings um, with the use of atria, and we've got a lot of them. And I didn't show you any of those um, uh, because I think that that's not, they're not as interesting as the three that I did show you, uh, where the, the focus was on something very specific for specific building types, uh, whether it be layers, towers, or, 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 or communities. And I think what's happening in, in, in our work right now is we're at the very beginning. These are the first evidence, uh, pieces of evidence, of where this, in our portfolio anyway, where these kinds of innovations can go and how they uh, might manifest themselves in a changed building type, I, I, I can't speculate with, but I can say that we are, we've just begun to look at those opportunities. And when the exception, I'm thinking of the sick, uh, Hospital for Sick Children Tower, when the exception uh, is only 10% of the floor plate, well, that's one thing. But when it's completely transforming the type while recognizing all of the other practical aspects of dry labs and things like that, I think we will start to see architecture and social interaction and space for collaboration, we'll see those things change. Um, so we're at the very beginning of, of that. There's, there's no question. Yeah, I, I would agree that um, 
I think what's happening right now is we're in a kind of a nostalgic, we're, we're a little bit nostalgic for a past we no longer have, you know, that, uh, that w where we, we had access to, to things that we could, you know, a world of things and a world of um, spaces that inspired, you know, um, bigger, you know, the kinds of things we used to do or we as a human race used to do before the digital age. Um, so I think we're in this kind of this this point where we're testing new things. Um, I think also what's happening certainly in um, U.S. cities is that things got really bad. Things get really really bad, and there's a point where um, you have to figure something out. You have to people step in because they have to figure out how else to do it. So these hybrid, a lot of these hybrid thi um, organizational funding models or organ uh, district organizational models or um, hybrid building typologies, I think come from, um, we can't do it the traditional way, the numbers don't work. We can't, we can't figure out how to get it done the way we used to get it done because it's just, there's, there's no more money out there for the public from the public sector, um, the, uh, we can't do what we used to do. I think also the other thing that a lot of people have talked about is the changing role of traditional professions. I mean, I think, um, I, I know I certainly wear many hats in my, I'm trained as an architect and have a degree in um, urban design, but I, I, I've got, you know, I'm, I, I am who I am and I work, people, I, the, the value I give is not always in those two, those two areas of my training. And you talked about the, the um, agent, uh, the, you know, autonomous, autonomous agent and you, you're like, you're designing friggin' flower pots, you know, like, <laughs> it, it's like a range of scales, right? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That didn't come out right, but, <laughs> but the, the but the the point is that the you know the boundaries. I think I mean you you are like a great example of someone who you say you have to sort of stand at the door, front door of City Hall every morning. I have this little image in my head of you kind of okay, put that hat on, take that hat off, walk in. For, you know, so I think I think that's a part of it too. But I don't think, I don't, I like Michael, I think we're just starting. And we have, we actually have the skills and the training to be a big part of, of, the, of the change that, that, that's occurring. But I mean, I, I don't want to draw the devil on the wall, or is this an expression? Uh, I recall one of the, so we, we had one of these discussions in our final year at CCA, and CCA is, an, in, is a California College of the Art, which is basically having all the interaction designers together, and the industrial designers, and the graphic designers, all of these industries that are a part of this boom, and the architects, we were seeing that there's an incredible growth in these departments because the economy is so healthy. So if you can design an app, you can just walk out of CCA and you can make a million around the corner. While as an architect, it's a very sli it's a slightly different industry and economy. And we were debating in the bar around the corner that actually that we are actually losing ground when we are not understanding that in the moment when this can become my office. Quite honestly, I don't need an office anymore. I can move in and out. I'm super flexible, warehouse, kitchen cabinet. It doesn't matter because all the intelligence, the design that I need in my digital physical environment actually lives in this little device. And there is something that is... Well, it's connected to a server, and the server is connected to a CNC mill or whatever. So we don't yet know what's going to happen. So our, our, our idea was that architecture is actually currently losing ground because of this movement. And I really like Don's comment saying, you can't sit at home and wait that somebody's calling you. You have to go out. And this is also something that I would like to hand over to our students, because it's really important that you have to define what your jobs are. 
you have to go out and you have to come up with ideas and you have to understand that architecture now operates on a lot of different scales from the city down to the design of the table that's going to carry the little iPhone because it's really important that these things are crossing a lot of scales. Or, or the flower pot. Oh, the yeah. No, the, uh, no I, I, I'm really glad you brought that up, Mona. Because, no, no, because, because, no, I, th I think it's, um, it's, 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 it's incumbent upon us as, as a group or as a, as a fraternity of people to, to really evolve. I mean, Darwin would want, I mean, this is how it works, right? So, so I, I think um, it's interesting you talk about the, you make that little Instagram app, make a billion bucks, you know, that everyone's just kind of, I'm a little nervous about our species if people are just waiting for Google to call or whatever, right? Uh, because where are we really going to spend good time doing good things? Now, I think the idea of the architect, and I, I think I had a bit of a rally cry maybe in there, and that, that we, we can't, you know, we can't just wait for someone else to have our good ideas that we are, are already kicking around, right? And, and it makes me think that the idea, the, the, the old model uh, of the architect of, of and I, I just think of this is so highly unsustainable, we all know this, you have that relationship with that one client that, that calls, uh, you get something great, you get a fantastic site, maybe a workable budget, and you make a bit of magic. It's fantastic, and guess what? They're done. They're kind of done, and all that time you spent for a relationship is actually so wasteful, it just goes away. Now, understandably, because they have maybe a singular site or whatever. That's why I will say, you know, in, in reality, mowing lawns is better business than maybe becoming an architect, because grass grows, but it shouldn't be that way, right? It shouldn't have to be that way, because that's what ad agencies might be about. They, they, have, they have accounts, right? People come back to them. Now, is there a role in which we as architects can actually have those scenarios in which we have relationships? And you connect with them. And I, I get the sense that, Kim, you, you've got a very good, it seems to be a really good setup that way with uh, various kinds of uh, uh, folks in the more infrastructural sort of world or transportation and other things. But I think that's something that we have to define ourselves and really start to, to revisit because there's no reason why we can't still, uh, and not in an apologetic or kind of, oh, shucks, this is what we've got to do kind of way, but as a way to move forward as architects. Um, I, I, I actually wanted to add something quite different to, to that. Um, uh, we, um, I think Jan talked about a, a, a while ago about changing politics and uh, the, the changing pattern of uh, politics in the United States where um, in, until recently state, um, <coughs> if, if the population at the state level voted conservative, they were very likely to vote conservative at the municipal level. But that's completely changed in the last few years, uh, very, very quickly. So that states, I think a lot of in, in New York State, Albany or Syracuse, a very liberal mayor in a very conservative state. And what that tells me is that there, there's a, an emerging three-dimensionality of politics, which means that um, our voice will change and our ability to speak as a small, in, in, in groups of different sizes is going to change to give that political environment almost a three-dimensional, three-dimensionality, which will mean that hopefully that cities will be able to evolve uh, more quickly and districts will be able to evolve more, it, it, more specifically to their particular needs. Um, Didn't you read the article by Ken Greenberg who was referring to a Ford, the Ford regime and that because this happened, we, smart cities are so important so that bad leadership, I hope that I don't offend anyone here at the table, has not such an impact on uh, urban development. So he, he really made a point for smart infrastructure and smart cities. I was gonna, actually going to go back and try to answer in an absolutely literal way your question, your first question, Philip. <laughs> Um, we're in a 1930s concrete warehouse right now on Adelaide Street. And what's happening to our practice is that more and more digital fabrication, pre uh, a test, a testing full scale mock ups of things, is something that, that we're doing. And in order to make it happen, we've got to go find a space somewhere else. It would be, and, and, and one of the things that's going on is we've got a room right now, it's actually it's way too big, and it's full of samples of materials that are parked there for years and years at a time. We're in the midst of a transformation now where we're going to get rid of all that stuff or give it away to maybe a region park and you can actually probably build a house with what we've got in our sample room and actually have it be a prototyping space. 
Um, and it would be great in the neighborhood if there was a prototyping space at large scale in the neighborhood connected to our studio. So if you're thinking what, what is the kind of spaces that uh, people in, in our world and other worlds are looking for, yeah, you want a place where you can t uh, uh, work as a team, conceive, test at a small scale in a 3D fabricator, and then work to the next level, maybe have it out in a lane, maybe have it, have it out in a back loading dock, and have, have it be somewhere where you can um, uh, work in a messy way with a little bit of extra space or maybe a shared studio that uh, you can go quite a bit further than you would before because as it turns out now um, uh, we're in our first project at the office where the model the Revit model is the complete document package we don't print any drawings we don't have any tender documents the model goes to the contractor um, it's the tip of the iceberg I know it's happening elsewhere in the world but in Toronto it's not that often um, and we, we foresee that that's, by the time you graduate, that'll be very common. We'll be building models, and that's it. That's, you'll, you'll be on site with an iPad. You'll be able to look at your, or a, or a screen. It won't be a layout table anymore. It'll be a screen rolling around with batteries, and you'll be able to identify in XYZ coordinates where stuff are. We know what happened for the Royal Ontario Museum to be able to locate all those structures in space. Now it's happening at projects with tiny budgets and very small scale contractors, and they're looking for that too. To be able to make that work, we've got to be able to prototype some of that stuff nearby, in our own studio or nearby. That's the kind of innovation that would start to make sense of where we are and the kind of creator space that we would need. There have been a number of really extraordinary strategies There's, it seems like a branding, I mean, in the most optimistic sense, a, you know, a, a naming and an identity is a, a, a crucial quality. And when we think about this extraordinary new, new road that, that might, might focus the, the, the south edge of the site and the widely varying kinds of fabric that might emerge um, in, in the future, the identity of this place it really merits some some investigation and, and, and some assertion. It would be, I, I would very much appreciate your, your suggestions about what the future identity of this place can be. And, and I, I would also appreciate your speculation directly about that South Road. It's been a place that's, content, that's been contested before, uh, it's been fragmented, but it seems like with, with the coincidence that, that, uh, that Andre Sorensen perhaps gave us this morning, Smart Track program, the the, 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 the 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 go station, the tremendous potency of, of that tra of the, tra the transportation hub, especially if electrification happens. It seems like this could become a, a genuine part part of the city as well. You know, right, 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 right. So could you speculate about the quality of that road when, when you think of this as a piece of the city? What do you see? Uh, I'm the outsider in the room, I think. Um, so uh, I don't, you know, I'm not that familiar with these things. But um, to your second question, I think the um, the the inner the the integration of a of thinking about mobility and transportation and urban development is critical. So it's not. Um, I don't think we have the liberty anymore, um, or it's not a it's not a good idea to think compartmentalized about um, the transit and the uh, transportation infrastructure and the built environment um, that you know and the uses that that um, exist and work in relationship to to those. Um, mo that, the mobility infrastructure. So, for example, when we talk about a go station, um, that should be more than just a shelter for people to um, shiver in. Um, maybe it's an actual place where you can um, do something productive, um, meet up with someone, um, grab a coffee. Uh, do something that while you're waiting, while you're shifting from one mode to another, um, take advantage of the time and the meeting place um, notion of, of, of that infrastructure. 
uh, likewise, a, a, a new road um, along that corridor um, should be much more than just a road. Uh, I mean, because it has all of these other things both related to mobility and to the economic, like to the economic prospects. Um, can I just add one to, to your first point, Philip, um, which I'm uh, trying to remember now, the branding. Oh, so um, I, I, I think um, the, the, the terrific thing about Liberty Village West is that um, it's, it's kind of that informal, it has emerged as this very, you know, uh, very uh, robust, uh, informal cluster of small businesses. Um, and if you, you can, uh, you can do something there that will uh, um, support that or nurture it or reinforce it or strengthen it. Um, maybe you want to introduce an anchor institution that actually creates a sort of feedback loop between research and development and education and industry. Or you could do something really, you could do something there that, that does exactly the opposite. And those, that cluster um, doesn't evolve in a positive way. Um, it's, it's going to evolve, but it doesn't evolve in a positive way. It kind of evolves in a, a negative way. Maybe it evolves away. <laughs> Um, so I think that the, the whole notion of creating the physical infrastructure, the physical form, the scale of the blocks, the scales of the buildings, the nature and quality and variation of the public spaces, the streets and the alleys and the squares and the, um, will allow you to kind of at least prevent certain things from happening. Um, uh, so anyway. So very quickly, Philip, when you started talking about branding of Liberty Village, I immediately thought about the one particular slide that I had up there with the new street. And I was really disappointed with that slide because it was pretty uh, plain vanilla. And um, when you were talking and asking your question, um, I also was reflecting on my experience in Regent Park as being part of the inner um, departmental working group, Daniel Spectrum mostly, but um, the overall redo of Regent Park. And one of the first things that happened in Regent Park in phase one was there was a new street, and Street A. And uh, the Toronto Community Housing Corporation um, wanted to be inclusive, and they put it out to the residents of Regent Park um, and asked them what they wanted the street to be called, because Street A, A is just a temporary name. And it was determined that it would be called Bangladesh Road. Well, um, I think we could do better than that. So, um, and, every, and the TCHC thought so as well. Um, the private developer, Daniel Spectrum, and the City of Toronto. So what we did was we took it to the Friends of the Poet Laureate. Uh, Dennis Lee was our first Poet Laureate at the City of Toronto, a poet, um, an author, um, his most famous book, uh, Alligator Pie. And uh, uh, so they did, uh, they went away, did a lot of research, um, and found that there was a person by the name Cole, who was a historian, who was an activist, who lived in Regent Park, and came up with the name Cole Avenue. Uh, and uh, we, we ran it by uh, the ambulance, fire, police, probably the pizza delivery guys too, <laughs> just to make sure <laughs> it would work. And uh, it, that's the name. And you'll, maybe you saw in the Globe and Mail, One Coal Avenue was the very first um, um, uh, tower that went up. But so it's, it's like sweating the details. It, it can be a lot richer um, um, by just thinking about something as simple as a street name. I think um, <clears throat> uh, the eastern part of Liberty Village is, is quite possibly one of the most disappointing recent developments in, in Toronto. Um, the street itself that leads off Strawn um, um, is is 
poorly conceived and ill-formed, urbanistically, spatially, and in terms of all the relationships that you could want to run, uh, uh, do right. And the streets that run into the, the shopping neighborhood are, are d not done to city street standards, but in fact they're, they're roadway standards, um, which means that they don't follow any of the, 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 the things we know that make streets work well. Um, <clears throat> on the west side, that's a different story, and the, and the grain of streets and, 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 um, and everything that was talked about favorably earlier, that is all working very well. The possibility of this new street south of the mess in the center of the plan could shift the center of gravity and make a spectacular rampart, terrace, overlooking the city, a new prospect of the city, and it could be done right. And you wouldn't have to endure um, uh, that poorly made street. That could possibly become the back. And this new street could become the front of Liberty Village uh, with the fantastic prospect of the water uh, uh, you know, through the towers and through the, the, uh, the uh, Fort York residences to the south. So that's a, that seems to be a very positive possibility. And it would be, mean trying to turn what the developers saw as the back on the railway lines to a front. Um, that would be quite interesting to, uh, to, to consider um, to, to, to correct the eastern part of Liberty Village. I mean, maybe to <clears throat> another question that might help the students in their design progress. They are also asked to design the piece of land that is in front of their site, which is basically a park that has a, a vacant lot on the left and on the right. So the whole idea is to create a linear park that runs parallel to the GO train line. And Kim, since you were showing the West Trail Pass, Rail Pass? Yes. So in, in Toronto, I mean, there are all of also the, uh, the circular line, that w the belt line that was originally a, um, a railway for the city. So there are everywhere these fragments of, let's say, green spaces that run parallel to the rail infrastructure. So, and you were talking earlier about networks, et cetera, et cetera. So Toronto is not necessarily a city like New York that has a gigantic central park. It consists more out of patches of green spaces. So I think it's really important for the students to also understand that this piece of land that is in front of their lot is really an important piece of green space that hopefully also can connect to other green spaces. Maybe if you con could comment on this, it would be great. Well, um, actually, uh, I've been, I was just kind of writing a piece for uh, a neighborhood in Toronto called, uh, it's a book that John Lawrence and um, Michael McClellan are editing about the ward. And, and I was looking at all the patterns of the ward and, and why was, my point was that it was inevitable that it would be completely erased. It was, you know, college to queen, university to young. And, um, and one of the kind of the points was, was that the Simcoe plan of the park lots, which is one of the sort of the, everyone thinks is somehow really, really interesting about Toronto, about park lot systems, you know, the long, narrow lots and that were kind of given out by Simcoe so that we would have a new landed gentry in Toronto, just what we needed to start off with. And, um, and, and it struck me that, that the whole problem with Toronto was that we, that set a, a, a template for the city where that all of those park lots were just developed by basically private developers. There was no overriding idea about what the city needed for public space at Grand Avenue. They were all arrived at circumstantially and by accident. So our ravine systems by default become our great public spaces. Well, okay, thanks a lot. I mean, if I could get down into one, it would be great. Um, but. Uh, and, and it's the same thing with you know the public spaces now. I think it's really important that public spaces be really, really carefully thought of and planned out in advance. Where the park is in relationship to the building is absolutely critical. And we don't have public spaces. Why we're kind of, you know, kind of going for scraps of land around the railroad corridors. But I still think have a lot of have it's a different kind of public space. It's a connection, kind of a linkage, which is really important. Great swaths of public space are something that we still need mm -hmm. in in the city, and, and I think that it's something that really has to kind of take on, on a kind of a central importance. Whereas in in the Dupont thing, one of the key things for us is taking those big cuts through those properties and, and saying you know the city should appropriate or expropriate something 
large kind of common areas that kind of break that area down to become big connection points to the hydro green line corridor and actually kind of go out on limbs and do that. The city does not have a great uh, record of doing that from, you know, from the Simcoe template that we've been, you know, kind of uh, dealing with forever and a day. So uh, the, the character of those spaces is great. The thing about, you know, the, the rail path is that within 10 meters you could do an amazing amount of stuff. It has to be really long. <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. If it's not long, it's not going to really work. So, but, uh, no, I, I really kind of think there's a lot to do with that. It can make loop systems. It can kind of connect back in very kind of interesting ways. So you shouldn't kind of disregard. I mean, even when you're designing a street and you get an extra, you know, 1,200 millimeters, it makes a huge difference. So the, all of those kind of small dimensions are, are of, of great import in public space. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think we should also not oversee the fact that this is an opportunity to reinvent the way a, a street can work. You know, that is, we, we, we build streets, we put sewers underneath them, and uh, by doing that, prevent that ever being developed as for another use underneath it. Um, whereas the cities like Lyon and France, they, they've, been, they've been tearing up the roads, putting in parking below them, and then replacing the road above. Um, so I, I see that whole strip, and if, if the students, if you look at your, the, the drawings that we gave you in the section, we sort of indicated that. Um, and and th that you know that that would be a special potential of that street, to for the first time actually put parking underneath it, and then think of what Jan said about the GO station and how important a node that is, and how that space underneath that road could actually work as a carpooling area, bicycle storage as just a, a, a point of transfer for developing and changing trans modes of transportation. I just have a question in regards to. Um, mm -hmm how these creative industries are keeping up with the ma manufacturing needs of the population. I think Michael, you talked earlier about the sort of mass exodus earlier into the suburbs because of this requirement for land so that we have these industrial spaces to create, you know, how many ever raspberries or like uh, blueberries, sorry. Wait, what are those films that? Uh, yeah, that's Red? right. Yeah. 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 Uh, blackberries, blackberries. Strawberry. Yeah. <laughs> Times have changed. Um. And, and now we're you know, coming back into the city, and the, the issue with the scarcity of land is still there. And you talk about you know, how at Diamond you have this prototyping center, or, or you guys are planning to have one where you can you know, do your own prototypes, but that doesn't address the issue of, you know, mass production. And, you know, I was wondering how are we going to, as architects, design for that? Is it, is it something like sort of a island of suburbs where we, you know, op offshore our manufacturing to, or is the vision like each household has their own 3D printer and, you know, we just sell, you know, 3D models? I, mean, I think the short answer to that, it's a, it's, it's a, it's everything. Um, um, one of the things that uh, one, one can do in making a building is make sure that the use that you're designing it for um, and the structure that you give it doesn't preclude it from, from uh, in the future having all the guts taken out of it, the systems taken out and replaced and uh, that something else is done with it. So this whole idea of, of loose fit um, and simple structures and durable structures means that um, what is today a shopping mall or a big box store next in 10 years from now is a, is a, is a place for manufacturing. It, it's that it's able to take advantage or, or able to respond to change. That'd be number one. So it's, a, it's tempting um, when you're beginning to design projects to, for, for, for there to be over articulation and over precision. It's natural. Um, but the long life of the city relies on you managing that and, and, and thinking about um, the future. Um, I guess the, the other side of it is that in the city there are still areas, they're called employment areas, and, and uh, one of the risks we run right now is a lot of those employment areas are being converted from employment to retail. Um, the city tries very hard to prevent it, um, but it's not being very successful. What we can do as architects is when we're developing new areas is to be thinking that this these first four or five floors of every building, that they may be convertible at some point in the future. Um, and um, 
uh, and that the employment areas can come back. Because in the same way that we are now occupying warehouses that were used for some kind of fabrication 50 or 70 years ago, but you were using them in the, in the, as designers or um, uh, 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 innovators or, or creators, um, uh, we may not be there forever either, and we may go somewhere else. So there's this constant change. I mean, the city is an infrastructure of constant change. Um, and uh, that's one of the slides that you saw me show you this morning. And it's addressed the very question that you're asking me now. Think about that. Think about that change. Um, and uh, it, it changes the way you think about your building. It just becomes a, uh, sometimes, at least for the first few floors, call it five floors, um, maybe a little more generalizable than one would first think. Anyone else? Anyone else? Rolf, shall we? Okay, so if, if there are no, I mean, I have tons of questions, but um, maybe we can continue because we had pizza, we had cookies, and there's another event that is organized by Bridge tonight. So we hope that you have still a little bit of energy left. Um, Terry Boak and Robert Jan have a book reception, and we are all invited to come up to Bridge Storefront on 60 Main Street. Zach just uh, told me to announce this for Bridge. Um, we, if you have still time, we would love to bring you up as well. There's a wine reception at least for 10 minutes to enjoy this, the end of the panel discussion. Um, at this point, I think we have a very, very big applause for you because it was really an amazing presentation and an amazing discussion. Thank you.